If your budget for a GPU is right around 100 US dollars, your choices can seem simultaneously hopelessly bleak and overwhelmingly complicated. I've rounded up 9 GPUs in and around the $100 price point according to US eBay Buy It Now pricing, and I'm gonna let you in on what the heck is in this segment, and if any of it is worth spending your hard-earned cash on. All set? Bottoms up. Let me introduce the GPUs in this comparison. First up are five Polaris cards, three Radeon Pros and two full-fat Polaris cards, the 480 and 590 GME. The Radeon Pros are single-slot workstation cards that don't require external power and as such don't perform super great, but I thought I'd include them for the heck of it. Next are two RDNA 1 cards, the 5500 XT 8GB and 5600 XT 6GB. These are somewhat forgotten RDNA 1 cards that live in the shadow of the 5700 XT, but they still perform pretty well in modern games. Next up is the lone NVIDIA card at this price level, a single fan GTX 1660 Super 6GB. This, along with the 1660 Ti, are the used market value kings for Team Green right now. Last, and most certainly least, is the RX 6400. This laptop GPU turned cash grab is more infamous than famous, and since there's no way any normal person is installing this turd into a new PCI Express 4 system, I'll be testing it at PCIe 3 speeds for extra pain. My test rig, as usual, is my PCI Express test bench, although I've swapped the CPU for a 5700G, which lets me also take a look at how the Ultimate AM4 APU's onboard graphics compare to these cards. All the AMD GPUs were tested using the Adrenaline 23.5.3 driver, yes, I've been working on this video for a while, while the 1660 Super used NVIDIA driver version 536.40. With all that out of the way, let's dive in. Starting out with some synthetic tests, I, you know, I'm going to save you some time and smash all these numbers into one graph here. There we go. That actually gives a great idea of the relative performance of these cards. It seems like this shouldn't work, but if you look at the subscores here, they're exactly what you'd expect. If the WX5100, for example, gets 23 FPS in Fire Strike, you'd expect the RX480, which is roughly twice as fast, to get roughly twice the frame rate, and it turns out it totally does. So as fun as it is to just take this chart and, you know, just point and laugh at the WX2100, I thought I'd shake things up a bit for this video. We're going to run five modern games on these graphics cards, yes, even on the WX2100, and I'll show you what frame rates and quality settings you can expect from each of them. The five games I'm testing are Rainbow Six Extraction, Apex Legends, The Last of Us Remake, Horizon Zero Dawn, and Spider-Man Remastered. For the single-player games, I'll be targeting a 60fps experience, as all true PC gamers should. And for the multiplayer titles, I'll be shooting for double that, 120 frames per second. I want to start with the RX 480 4GB, a very reasonable choice for a budget used graphics card, basically up until the start of 2023 and the great VRAM debacle that was kicked off by The Last of Us Part 1. The copy I have here is the reference blower model with the full Polaris 10 die, so that's 36 compute units, 2304 shaders, 144 texture mapping units, and 32 render outputs. These cards are available on US eBay for about $60 to $65, so let's see how it performs. Starting off with The Last of Us and benchmarking the wooded section everyone loves, uh, you can run this game at about 60 FPS on low settings with quarter resolution shadows at an amusing 720p with FSR quality enabled. You can, of course, push that up to 1080p with FSR if you're looking for a few more pixels in exchange for a few fewer frames, but the upscaling in either case tends to eat the particle effects in the game like these fireflies. So if you're looking for native resolutions only, well, 360p will see you never south of 60fps. Fireflies are preserved, though not much else is. 
I am told there is a game underneath all those pixels. Moving on to Spider-Man Remastered, this is using the medium preset at 900p with the built-in upscaler targeting 60fps. The game manages to hit it most of the time, though when swinging through densely populated areas of the city, you can see frame rates dip down into the upper 40s as the card struggles to keep up with the streaming media requirements. However, most of the time, this is a pretty enjoyable experience. Up next is Horizon Zero Dawn, and at first I thought this card would be a shoe in at 1080p original settings, but it turns out the built-in benchmark is a bit optimistic, and actual gameplay ends up being about 10 frames per second slower than the benchmark scores. So I turned on FSR quality and was rewarded with mid to upper 70s in frame rate, which should translate to nice 60 FPS or greater uh, values in game. If you're looking to play the game in native res, 900p at original quality should do you just fine. This is a great showing for the RX 480. That is in contrast to the first of our multiplayer titles, Rainbow Six Extraction. This game has some kind of beef with the RX 480 and refuses to hit 120 FPS with any kind of reasonable resolution settings. So, rather than play at 720p at 120, I settled for 105 to 110 FPS at 1080p, using the built-in dynamic res scale system targeting 120 FPS, to smooth out spikes in the frame times. This actually works out okay, with the game looking pretty great and running really nicely, all things considered. Last, but certainly not least, is Apex Legends, which absolutely loves the RX 480. I'm testing on the training map for consistency's sake, and I'm using a mix of uh, lowish quality settings here, since I know enemy visibility is going to be more important than things like shadow quality and effects flashiness. The RX 480 does great, and eats this game up at the somewhat strange resolution of 1760 by 990 I left the dynamic res scale on, but you'll rarely touch it, with the game happily churning out 120 to 144 FPS in the training map, occasionally dipping to 100 if there are large alpha effects on screen, like the thermite grenade's fire effect. So do I recommend the RX 480? Absolutely not, and it's for the same reason I don't recommend Pascal-based NVIDIA cards either. As capable as this architecture is, it's not long for this world. No one knows when AMD will kill driver support for Polaris, but some game devs have already moved on. And I think with ever more complex 9th gen console ports on the horizon, Polaris is just going to struggle even more than it already does today. So if I don't recommend a full Polaris 10 implementation like the RX 480, what are these Radeon Pros even doing here? These diminutive discrete graphics cards are a nod to the reality of being a low-end PC gamer, especially a recycled office PC low-end PC gamer. These cards don't represent the best cost per frame on the used market, not by a long shot, but the best value option in the world doesn't mean a thing if it's outside your budget or doesn't fit in your PC. In the US, the single cheapest way to go from nothing to a functional PC is buying a recycled office PC. Throw in a recycled monitor, a keyboard, and a mouse, and you can have a complete computer for less than the price of an e-waste drugstore Android tablet. So what these pre-built friendly cards represent, then, are the difference between being a low-spec gamer and not gaming at all. Let's start off by taking a look at these cards in Apex Legends. All three cards are at 720p low settings. The WX2100 leans on the dynamic res scale quite a bit here, but it makes it into the low 90s, while the WX4100 gets to high 90s pretty consistently, without DRS assisting all that much. Finally, the WX5100, with its 75% more shaders, gets to 110 FPS, or about 10-20% faster than the WX4100. This is a pattern we're going to see repeat thanks to the WX5100's extremely limited power budget. 
Meanwhile, in Rainbow Six Siege, uh, the WX2100 has a really awful time, uh, not even able to crest 60 FPS at 1024 by 768. Meanwhile, the 4100 and 5100 fare significantly better, uh, the 5100 even able to get into the 120 FPS area. Um, the 4100 does pretty well here as well, 900p ultra low settings, uh, returning an average of about 110 FPS. Things are looking pretty good for the, the two higher end Radeon Pros in this game actually. Moving over to Horizon Zero Dawn, the WX2100 continues to struggle here despite its memory running at the correct settings in this game. It's only really able to manage 640x480 at favored performance quality settings. The 4100 does better here, able to run the same quality level at true 720p instead, while the WX5100 on the other hand can lean a little on its VRAM and push texture and shadow quality up to high, while also increasing resolution to 900p thanks to a little FSR too. Firing up Spider-Man and the WX2100 manages to make an almost playable experience at 800x600 low settings, while the 4100 can do the same at the true HD resolution of 720p. Wow! Once again, the WX5100 can lean on its VRAM a little and enable a mixture of medium and high settings to sharpen up textures and shadows, though all three cards do start to chug a little once you get out into the city and you're swinging around. And here it is, the game everyone's been waiting for, The Last of Our VRAM Part 1. The WX2100 actually runs this game, which is a feat in and of itself, although it can only muster around 30 FPS at 360p and the very low preset. Talk about PS1 era graphics. The 4100, despite coming in almost exactly twice as fast as its little brother in previous tests, only provides about a 50% boost in frame rates here, achieving a fairly stable mid-40s, again at 360p very low. And the extra shader count of the WX5100 finally shows up to the party, with nearly 60fps at 360p very low settings. All in all, this game is exactly as much of a bloodbath as you'd expect on these poor little Radeons, but if you're looking for more pixels, FSR can get you a pretty okay looking 1080p experience on the 5100, surprisingly, if you're okay with about 30 FPS. So those are the Radeons Pro. Hopefully if you've been eyeing them for your own computer, you've either been sufficiently dissuaded, or now you have a better idea of what you're getting yourself into. Let's move on to a Polaris I can almost recommend if it weren't for the looming driver support question mark hanging over pre-RDNA Radeons. This is the RX 590 GME, and like the recently launched 7900 GRE, this was a China-only special edition that took features and performance from one tier down and slapped the next tier up's name on it. This card is basically just an RX 580. This XFX version has a mild overclock above both a stock 580 and a typical 590 GME, but it's still about 150 MHz shy of an actual 590, and of course still uses a 14 nanometer process instead of the 590's 12 nanometer process. Let's see what it can do. Setting off on our journey with Horizon Zero Dawn, this runs quite nicely at 1080p original quality preset, yielding a steady 65 to 75 FPS in the built-in benchmark without need for upscaling at all. And as we've seen with previous benchmarks in Horizon, this means the in-game frame rate will be right around 60 FPS, and it totally is. This game looks great and runs great on the RX 590 GME. Swinging on over to Spider-Man, 1080p medium preset with maxed out textures yields a significantly more consistent 60fps experience than the previous cards on this list. The extra clocks and VRAM on the 590 GME really help with streaming data into and out of the card for this game.
Rainbow Six Extraction is up next, and the Curse of Polaris continues here. Despite leaving DRS on, the game refuses to hit the 120 FPS requested at 1080p medium settings. It's not bad or anything, coming in at 110 FPS on average, it's just annoying that this game doesn't run better on a GPU like this. Apex Legends is up next, and like the RX 480, Apex really likes running on the 590 GME. I took the 480 settings, clicked the resolution up from 990p to 1080p, and set the texture slider to 8 gigs of VRAM. The result? 120 to 144 FPS. No problems. And last on the list is The Last of Us, and this is expectedly where the good performance we've been seeing with the RX 590 GME falls off a cliff. The only saving grace here is that the extra VRAM allows this card to use the medium preset instead of low and turn up the textures all the way. At 720p native res, we're not even allocating 7GB of VRAM comfortably within the card's buffer. So if you're looking for a GPU-shaped object for your PC and you can feed this card the 8-pin power connector it wants, this could actually be a reasonable option for the short term, as prices for the GME version, as well as the 580s it's so similar to, have fallen fairly dramatically in recent weeks. As we leave the Polaris star system and venture onwards towards the more modern and expensive GPUs in this comparison, I think it's important to first temper our expectations by looking at AMD's most disappointing product launch since RDNA made its debut in 2019, the RX 6400. This is a 12 compute unit RDNA 2 GPU with 768 shaders, 48 texture mapping units, and 32 render outputs with 4 gigabytes of VRAM. Total board power here is about 50 watts, so no external power connector is needed. Now, it's no secret that this thing is actually a laptop GPU on a PCB, and as such, it has some major limitations. First of all, there's only two video outputs on the card, so if you need to plug in more than two monitors, good luck. Second, it has no video encoder block on the GPU die, so accelerating video encode, it's not going to happen here. And lastly, it connects to the rest of the system over a drinking straw like four PCI Express lanes, which is just not enough bandwidth to get textures on and off of the card in real time while you're playing games. Now with all that said, and all of that out of the way, let's see how this pandemic cash grab performs in our five game tests. Starting out with Apex Legends, I'm able to simply duplicate the settings used for the RX 480, including that somewhat odd resolution of 990p, and I'm rewarded with almost identical performance, 120 to 144 FPS, never really touching the dynamic res scale unless there are large alpha effects on screen. If Apex loved Polaris, it loves RDNA even more. Touching down in Rainbow Six Extraction, the curse of Polaris is finally lifted, and the RX 6400 delivers well into the 120 FPS region at 1600 by 900 very low settings. Again, the dynamic res scaler is enabled, but doesn't really do much with this card at this resolution. We're still well under the 4GB VRAM cap as well, yielding silky smooth gameplay. Scouting our way over to Horizon Zero Dawn, and once again 1080p original settings with FSR quality, yields high 50s, low 60s in-game and higher frame rates in the benchmark owing to its reduced usage of alpha effects, around 75 FPS. The RX 6400 really struggles to escape Spider-Man Remastered's web, unfortunately, with performance starting off strong and then really tanking once the four PCI Express lanes are saturated with streaming data. While this hurt the RX 480, it destroys the RX 6400, with frame rates dipping into the 30s and sometimes mid-20s as the card struggles to pull data over the PCI Express bus each frame. Surprisingly, the card escapes zombification in The Last of Us, able to return around 60 FPS at 720p very low at 80% resolution scale. This is certainly more palatable than the Radeon Pros, at least.
About the only good thing I can say about this card is that if you can manage to stay under its paltry 4GB VRAM buffer, it does manage to perform almost identically to an RX 480. So if you pick up one of these small form factor versions, you, you basically get an RX 480 in your pocket, which is kind of impressive. However, there are very real downsides to consider. First, if you overstep the 4GB VRAM buffer, the card only has four PCI Express lanes to bring fresh texture data onto the card, leading to low frame rates and stutter for no apparent reason as the card swaps textures. This can be mitigated somewhat if you put it into a PCI Express 4.0 system, but that requires building something new for a card that's this low performance. Secondly, since it only has two display outputs, if you're doing VR and using a direct attached VR headset, well, ha, welcome to having one monitor again. 2010 is calling. And lastly, because the card also lacks an on-dive video encoder, things aren't much better if you have a Quest or a Pico style headset that depends on streaming compressed video to the headset over USB. Removing the video encoder block is a decision I still find baffling for a video card released in 2022. So what's the long and short of it? Well, I say, avoid this GPU at all costs. Except in very, very specific circumstances, which I'll cover in an upcoming video, I don't think this thing belongs in any system that's being made brand new today. Please don't. <laughs> Please don't do it. There are much better options. In fact, they're coming up next in the video. Moving up the performance ladder, we have the RX 5500 XT 8GB. The RX 5500 XT is a 22 compute unit RDNA 1 card launched at the end of 2019. It has 1408 shaders, 88 texture mapping units, and 32 render outputs, and normally comes equipped with 4GB of VRAM. What makes this version interesting is the doubling of frame buffer capacity to 8GB. These are available on US eBay for around $90 to $120. In my big graph at the start of the video, this was neck and neck with the RX 590 GME. Let's see if that holds true. I hope the RX 6400 tempered your expectations sufficiently, because Spider-Man Remastered on the 5500 XT 8GB is a tour de force. I'm running this at 1080p high settings with very high textures, and the lowest we're seeing in this introductory web swinging section is, like, the low 50s? And only for a moment before the card recovers. The game is allocating comfortably under the card's 8GB VRAM limit, and the 8 PCI Express lanes the 5500 XT has are sufficient to shuttle data onto and off of the card without frame rates tanking like we saw with the 6400. Bravo! This is a good time! Horizon Zero Dawn at 1080p original quality performs almost exactly like the RX 590 GME, yielding high 50s, low 60s in-game, and an average of 72 FPS in the built-in benchmark. Another terrific performance by the goofy little RDNA 1 card here. Rainbow Six Siege at 1080p medium preset with ultra textures returns a buttery smooth 121 FPS average in the built-in benchmark, peaking in the mid-130s. No issues here with this squad-based first-person shooter. Fourteen forty p low with the eight gigabyte textures and Apex Legends is a bit too much to ask for from the little fifty five hundred XT, as it tends to bounce off the dynamic resolution scaler too frequently for my liking. However, ten eighty p with the same settings but adding in high model detail gets us back into that golden zone of one twenty to one forty four fps. Glorious. And finally, to answer the burning questions everyone has been asking. How does the 5500 XT run the last of our VRAM part 1? Does the 8GB of VRAM help? Does anything? Why don't I feel anything anymore? How can a loving god cause such agony? Look, I get it. It's video card schadenfreude. If you skipped right over to this section, I don't blame you. Turns out, you can get just about 60fps with this card at 900p, 90% res scale, medium preset, and ultra textures. Not bad, right? For a slightly sharper experience, minus the fireflies, you can enable FSR2 quality and take it up to an even 1080p. It turns out, it does the thing! Finally, we're here. We made it. 
The last two GPUs, the Radeon RX 5600 XT 6GB and the GeForce GTX 1660 Super 6GB. When they were new, these GPUs didn't directly compete with one another. Based on launch prices, the 5600 XT competed most directly with the 1660 Ti, with the Super being a slower, less expensive option that released almost a year later. The Super is no slouch, though, thanks to faster VRAM than its bigger brother, there's only about a 10-15% to performance difference between the two. So let's see how these two cards perform in the five-game GPU deathmatch of death! Ready? Go! Starting off with Apex Legends at 1440p, we have a good showing for both cards, with frame rates in the 120 to 144 FPS region. Although the GeForce is closer to 120 more often than the Radeon, and will briefly touch the 100 FPS lower limit and trigger the dynamic res scale. To be fair, both cards hit DRS at 1440p when there are full screen fire effects on screen, but beyond that, the Radeon didn't touch it while I was running around in my loop in the training map. Next up, it's... well, it would have been Rainbow Six Extraction, but for whatever reason, it refuses to launch on my 1660 Super. I tried pretty much every trick I can think of to get this game to run on this card, it just wasn't having it. It's not like the game is allergic to Nvidia cards or anything, it ran fine on my ridiculous AIO modded 1080 Ti, for example. By the way, 1440p Ultra at 130fps. So while I had expected one of the, you know, eight Radeons I tested in this video to be the card that fell on its face, like, I don't know, maybe the one with two gigabytes of VRAM? In the end, it ended up being the 1660 Super. Bummer. Anyway, the 5600 XT runs extraction like a champ, returning 134 FPS on average at 1080p high settings. And both cards run Spider-Man Remastered at 1440p, except here I have the 1660 Super running the medium preset, while the 5600 XT can handle the high preset. Both deliver consistent, smooth 60fps experiences, suggesting at this combination of settings, 6 gigs of VRAM may be all that's needed for this game's streaming media requirements. Now, Horizon Zero Dawn is interesting because the 1660 Super isn't quite fast enough for 1440p here, but it's complete overkill for 1080p, so I've got it running at 1080p in the ultimate preset, while the Radeon 5600 XT is running 1440p in the original preset with ultra textures and shadows. Both cards run the game well, with about 60fps in-game and slightly more in the built-in benchmark. Finally, The Last of Us Part 1. Here, both cards will pretty happily run 1080p with a medium preset, although the performance deficit on the 1660 Super means it's pretty consistently about 15% behind the Radeon in absolute frame rates. 900p should solve that, or of course, you can apply some DLSS if you... Oh wait, that's right, the 16 series can't do DLSS. Oopsies. Either way, both cards have no issues running this game with reasonable quality settings. Despite the sheer number of GPUs in this comparison, this is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to $100 GPUs in the secondary market right now. An example of a GPU I missed, the 1070, is about 100 bucks right now and will perform somewhere between the 1660 Super and TI, depending on the game. Also, Vega 56 is down to about $100 these days, and that card paints a similar story in terms of performance. So, which of these cards do I recommend? Well, honestly, the 5600 XT is pretty unbeatable in price to performance, consistently outperforming everything else in the roundup. It's got great power consumption numbers, thanks to being built on 7 nanometer. It has, and should continue to have, excellent game compatibility, thanks to RDNA being present in all the major non-Nintendo game consoles right now, including the Steam Deck. It finally has a competent video encoding block on die with Graphics Core Next, and in my testing it matched or outperformed the 1660 Super in transcoding 4K60 media into H.265. However, if your livelihood has anything to do with streaming to Discord, 
you'll want the slower GeForce because Discord continues to refuse to implement video encode acceleration for AMD GPUs in its streaming services. If that annoys you, I highly recommend bothering Discord about it because, frankly, it's bordering on collusion at this point given the popularity of Discord for gaming. The 5500 XT was an interesting and quirky card, but it just goes to show you that VRAM alone will not save a GPU if it lacks the shading horsepower to make use of it. The 590 GME, and by extension any 580s you might run across, surprised me with its comfortable performance lead over the 480. If it weren't for the age of the Polaris architecture, I'd make it a recommendation at its price point. And finally, the rest of the cards performed pretty much as I had expected. I was surprised by the capability of the WX4100 4GB. That card looks like a nothing sandwich on paper, but it was able to keep up with the 5100 pretty easily while fitting in significantly more cramped, pre-built PCs. Look, I'm going to be honest, this video kind of destroyed me. I've been at this thing for way too long, and I suddenly realize now why Random Gaming in HD and Iceberg Tech and others stick to one or two GPUs per video. I'd say, you know, subscribe for more insane benchmark fests, but the truth is that I'm, I won't be doing a video like this for the foreseeable future. It's just too much work for my present workload outside of the channel. Please do stick around for some CPU benchmarks I have coming up in the near future, as well as a video about making a cheap home lab if you need to brush up on your IT skills and don't want to, you know, hose your primary computer doing so. So with that, thank you so much for watching. Please make like a werewolf YouTuber and like and subscribe. Have a great night, and may the PC parts be ever in your favor.